Hey guys, Tyler here. The holodeck is, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating technologies in Star Trek. First featured in the Next Generation pilot Encounter at Farpoint, holodecks use a combination of advanced projection and force field techniques and processes to simulate holographic environments. We see them installed aboard starships, space stations, and various Starfleet installations. They serve a variety of purposes, not just for entertainment, but also investigations, medical treatments, and especially training. But how on earth do holodecks provide the illusion of real objects, environments, and distances? And could we possibly build something like them in real life? Let's find out. Before we dive in, I want to take a minute to tell you all about today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Looking for ways to save money this spring? Skip the checkout lines because HelloFresh has dinner covered. With 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week, HelloFresh has options for everyone and every lifestyle. April is Earth Month, so you should know HelloFresh has always been committed to a cleaner planet. Their meals have, on average, a 31% lower carbon footprint than the same meals made from supermarket ingredients. HelloFresh's pre-portioned seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness for quality you can taste, and they cut down on food waste by at least 23% compared to grocery shopping. You may not know this, but for years I've thoroughly enjoyed cooking. But cooking takes time. That's why receiving HelloFresh meals every week not only saves you 25% compared to takeout, but it saves time on those busy weeknights. That's why I was super excited to try Beef Flautas Supreme with Pico de Gallo and Smoky Red Pepper Crema, and it hit the spot. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code ORANGERIVER50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. That's HelloFresh.com, offer code ORANGERIVER50 for 50% off, plus free shipping on your first box. Now, back to the video. A typical holodeck consists of a room equipped with omnidirectional holographic diodes that enable high-fidelity holographic projections. Elements of transporter technology, replicators, holography, and force fields all work in unison to provide the illusion of objects with substance. When you proceed to interact with a hologram representing, for example, a person, during a handshake, the system is constantly scanning the ever-changing position and contours of your hand and projects into it precision-shaped force beams that fit the hollow person's corresponding hand and thus make it feel solid. Depending on the settings, these tangible or haptic hollow objects can exist outside a hollow deck for only a brief period of time, though often none at all, before quickly losing cohesion and reverting back to pure energy without the support of a hollow grid. Hollow decks are powered by hollow deck reactors that are separate from the main power of the ship, which is why hollow decks can function even when normal replicators are offline. This is most likely designed for practical and safety reasons owing to the energy-intensive tech that would normally cause massive power drains. Integrated biofilters also scan for biological anomalies that may be harmful and must be periodically removed and emptied of waste matter. Holodecks have databases that store maps, programs, customized holograms, and holographic templates, with holobuffers able to store complex primed holograms while inactive. Because of this ability to store highly complex energy patterns, it is sometimes possible to store a person's physical parameters from their transporter pattern in the holodeck database. Furthermore, holodecks are often equipped to change gravity in three dimensions. Manipulating the laws of motion via anti-grav tech is often a must when one wants to experience a realistic simulation of, for example, diving. On a holodeck, one would experience most of the dive as hovering in mid-air. For instance, after jumping off a holographic springboard, the deck's subsystem systems precisely synchronize to create the illusion of a dive, acting as the reverse of inertial dampeners, basically futuristic shock absorbers, but for SPACE! Force field projectors mounted inside the walls of the hollow deck aim to create from scratch the kinetic energy inside the room. The example of diving into a swimming pool 
also brings us to the example of replicated hollow matter, only a fraction of the water you'd fall into in your immediate proximity would actually be real and could leave the holodeck with you before disappearing into thin air, so to speak. One of the biggest reasons for this is, put simply, an actual Olympic-sized swimming pool just wouldn't fit inside of a holodeck. With the vast majority of water in the pool being an optical projection, perfectly blended with your real puddle that you'd be swimming through on the spot. And this on-the-spot phenomenon is, by the way, called the treadmill effect, and is achieved via a substrate force field that enables the hollow program participants to more or less be stationary while the simulated environs effectively scroll by. Now imagine you're in there with friends on a hollow deck measuring approximately 5 by 10 meters. If one of your friends walks towards a landmark one simulated mile in the distance, they'd still be in reality just four or so meters from you. Just try to picture this ridiculousness for a moment. A hollow deck could project a massive cathedral into this few meters wide space between you and your friends, and from your perspective it would look totally appropriate. The possibilities are virtually endless. All this intricate computing being made possible by the hollow deck's integrated subsystems at every fraction of a second, taking into account every possible variable in an environment. It's no surprise that holodecks are a distinctly late 24th century invention. Of course, we see the seeds for such technology present in earlier centuries. In the Enterprise episode Unexpected, the 22nd century NX-01 crew encounters a Zerillion vessel, which has a holographic chamber superficially similar to what we'd see from Starfleet in later centuries. Shortly after this encounter, the Klingons even adapt this technology for their own use which could have possibly led to their later innovations with cloaking devices. In the 23rd century, we see holographic combat training simulations as early as 2256 aboard the Crossfield class USS Discovery, a vessel which of course employs a number of other experimental technologies. The mycelial network like Mycelial Network! And in the animated series episode, The Practical Joker, we learn that Constitution-class starships like the USS Enterprise have brand new holographic recreation rooms by 2270. This recreation room can simulate full environments, including pre-programmed illusions simulated climate and weather events, and pre-recorded audio. As these precursors clearly demonstrate a mastery of holographic technology even within Starfleet by the mid-23rd century, it's at first unclear what makes them distinct from proper 24th century holodecks. In my view, though, this has to do with at least three key principles. Dimensionality, or spatial orientation, matter replication, and artificial intelligence. We've already discussed the first two to an extent, but when it comes to the proto-holodecks prior to the late 24th century, one limitation is that, even though the scenery stretches beyond the confines of the room, one can still encounter walls during a simulation. This problem is solved with next-generation holodecks which allow a much greater freedom of movement. Though it is still possible to knock into walls if an unexpected action is taken and the program can't react in time. Holodecks can also be controlled from either an exterior control panel, bridge control relays, or even an interior arch. This arch can be summoned at any time to change parameters while running a program, and it is generally on the same level as the lowest point of a simulated environment's ground floor, though this is not always the case. Additionally, holodecks have safety protocols to prevent serious injury, though these can be disabled by senior staff, meaning holographic bullets, for example, can become fatal. So how is it possible that holodecks are actually able to cohere this energy into a material material object that one can interact with? Well, in order to answer that, we need to get even more technical. In-universe, holodecks exert fine control over magnetic containment fields at incredibly tiny scales. Molecule-sized magnetic bubbles simulate surfaces and textures, manipulated by a computer in three dimensions. These bubbles contain photons, the very basis of holography. Of course, the complexity of electron shell activity and the motion of atoms within molecules cannot be projected 
holographically. This is what prevents replicators from duplicating life and resurrecting the dead. This is also why 24th century holodecks take advantage of leaps in replicator technology far beyond the simple food synthesizers of the 23rd century. I explore the mechanics behind matter replication in a separate video, which you should check out if you haven't already. Link in the description. As you might expect, the holography associated with holodecks is far beyond the realm of virtual or augmented reality in today's world, and even beyond modern holograms. Obviously, VR and AR can only be observed with special eye gear, and are still two-dimensional projections, either inside a computer or projected onto the real world through phone or eyeglass filters. But surely with advances in modern-day hologram technology, we could create a holodeck sooner than later, right? Could Spider-Man Far From Home become real? Okay, let's, let's pump the brakes for a minute. You see, real-life holograms are, again, 2D projections that give the illusion of depth. They are the result of laser light being reflected through a prism made of glass, or a similar material. And volumetric displays, which are still not widely used in everyday life, still lack the tactile interaction associated with holograms in Star Trek. There are, however, real-world primitive precursors to Star Trek's touchable holograms. One technology is called aerohaptics, haptic of course referring to the broad sense of touch. A motion sensor tracks the movement of a user's hand as they interact with a holographic object and directs a set of moving nozzles to release puffs of air onto contact points of the user's fingers and palm. There's also the so-called haptoclone, a hologram that gives the user the illusion of actually touching it via emission of ultrasonic radiation pressure as opposed to air pressure. So is the holodeck even remotely realistic? Well, it obviously depends on how fast our computer technology continues to advance. One promising field that could provide the key to real-life holodeck-like environments is lattice quantum chromodynamics. A theory of the interaction of elementary particles like quarks and gluons, LQCD allows for the simulation of objects and processes in near-perfect detail, using resolutions based on the fundamental physical laws. But if you don't need to simulate every subatomic particle, then a more efficient method from a memory and processing power standpoint is optoelectronics. In fact, optoelectronics, commonly called optronics, is explicitly stated in the episode Year of Hell Part 2 to be the basis for hologram technology in Star Trek. And naturally so, because optronics is an application of electronic devices that manipulate photons. It works based on the quantum mechanical effects of light, including semiconductors and the presence of electrical fields. Electrical conductivity can be altered by introducing impurities into the crystal lattice structure of a semiconductor made of, for example, silicon or germanium. This process is called doping. <laughs> and it greatly increases the number of charge carriers, like electrons and ions, within the crystal. It's this type of quantum effect that laid the groundwork for the invention of the transistor and the integrated circuit in the mid-20th century. In addition to doping, conductivity in a semiconductor can be improved by raising its temperature. But another way for excited electrons to relax is to release light instead of heat. These semiconductors are used in the construction of things like LEDs, and they also have a variety of other optronic applications. These include photovoltaics in solar cells, photoresistors like in street lights, stimulated emission like in lasers, or photoemissivity like in vacuum tubes. And another important optronic application is, as you may have guessed, fiber optic communications. And in Star Trek, the holodeck, just like holograms in general, make wide use of optronics in the form of cables, data cores, emitters, relays, and more. Going back to the VR angle, it's easy to draw parallels between the holodeck and current advances in VR. The tech has come a long way since the days of the Virtual Boy. Now you've got your Oculus Rifts, your HTC Vives, your PlayStation VRs. But again, we're talking about the difference between 2D and 3D. Even 
the latest, greatest VR is still on a screen with the display resolution not too dissimilar from the highest end TV monitors. When are we getting Jaws 19 like in Back to the Future or Joy in Blade Runner 2049. Currently, the biggest hurdles holding back volumetric displays are bandwidth and parallax. But bandwidth would be less of an issue for a 24th century galaxy class starship. And parallax issues, that is, limitations with how uniform a holographic object can look from different angles, could be resolved with more advanced projection technology. Indeed, this is how holodecks could keep users from running into walls. A combination of elaborate projection techniques combined with the treadmill effect and other special orientation methods. The holodeck would also use electromagnetic fields to confine plasma into various shapes, similar to the principle on which Star Trek's deflector shields operate. Even in real life, we've been able to guide plasma using extremely tiny lasers that focus their beams in specific directions, generating interactive light displays that float in mid-air. If the laser pulses are emitted very quickly and in rapid succession, say once every hundred trillionth of a second, then the plasma can stay cool enough that you can harmlessly interact with it. This is probably how holograms provide tactile feedback. The integrated transporter and replicator technologies also provide other tangible items like rain, snow, smells, or various takeaway hollow props like food, clothing, or Moriarty's drawing of the Enterprise D, among many others. It's all a big, grand illusion. Which is why when Riker sets foot on the Enterprise D's holodeck for the first time in Encounter at Farpoint, he's completely blown away by how real it all is. Hopefully this video offered a sufficient overview of the science and technology of the holodeck, and how it could be perceived as an evolution of current VR and holographic technologies. Obviously, I didn't go into a lot of detail about sentient holograms like Moriarty, Vic Fontaine, or The Doctor, but that's perhaps best left for another video. The main reason I wanted to make this, honestly, is to examine just how much more advanced TNG's holographic technology is compared to earlier prototypical examples in the 23rd century show. Science takes time, and taking into account advances in data storage and processing power, we can see a clear evolution from the rec rooms on 23rd century starships and the holodecks and hollow suites a hundred years later. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.